Aren't you great? You are, and we are so blessed to have a councilwoman who is just extremely talented and uh, very persuasive. And when she says she asks me all the time, she is absolutely correct. Suitland is usually the first word out of her mouth. What are we doing for this community? Um, I, I want to thank the uh, I want to thank the uh, Suitland Civic Association for all the work you are doing and all the work you have been doing. Um, President Anderson, like you, I have three children that have gone to Suitland High School. My baby, knock on wood, is graduating this year. Um, so I know this community very well. Uh, my son who graduated from here is also graduating, getting his master's. So right here in this community, just think about it. Uh, and uh, before we get started, I'm gonna make sure that we have time for questions. But the reason I talk about Suitland a lot, and my staff knows this very well, I think they've heard it ad nauseum, that if nothing else happens before this administration's over, you will see the progress in this community. I judge this administration by Suitland. And the reason I do is for a very, very, very selfish reason. I said this when I was campaigning, and I'll say it again. It is because it is this community where my wife and I dropped off the things that are most precious to us in the entire world, our three children. It is in this community that we trusted that they would get a quality education and that they would return home safe. And they did. It is this community we turned to to say, look after our babies. So for that very selfish reason, I consider it my duty to make sure that the things that I want to see happen for Prince George's County start right here in Suitland. Everyone on my staff knows that, and we're about to announce in about two days, one of our major neighborhood initiatives, where we're not only bringing public safety, but we're bringing every facet of the government that you see here before you to tackle some of the really tough issues that face Prince George's County. I believe that we are not only the economic engine for this region, but for this state. And I believe a shining example of what we could be and what we are going to be is right here in Suitland. Let's think about it. In this time of economic crisis, how many places can you point to that have at least three federal enclaves already here? We're not trying to recruit, they're right here. How many places can you turn to when a time when we're talking about economic development and transit-oriented development that you can point to a metro station that's already there, that's a direct line to the District of Columbia. This right here, in this community, you are a stone's throw away from the nation's capital, where everybody else is trying to come back toward the nation's capital as what my good friend Wayne Curry calls Rome, because it is the only place where they can print money. Now, I can't print any money, at least legally, in Prince George's County, but they can print it there. So everyone is trying to get back to the federal government and get close to it. But if you were watching the news the other day, the District of Columbia is trying to go, is trying to get the rights to build up in the air, air rights. Did you see that? You know why? They can't go out, they're landlocked. The District of Columbia is landlocked. Northern Virginia is landlocked. Montgomery County is landlocked. The only place that can go out is us. So that means if you're a company trying to relocate to this area, this is the place where you're most attractive. But it does mean we have to do a couple of things. We have to make sure that our reputation, which is based on education and public safety, that's it, that's your calling card. That's your calling card. That means we, we need to make sure we're making improvements in education, and we're going to do that. In this budget that I submitted to uh, Council Member Tolles and her colleagues, even though we had to close a $126 million deficit, and we asked every department, many of the men and women that are sitting up here today who are gonna answer some of your questions, we asked every department to again this year reduce their budget by 5%. We asked them to continue to provide quality service but reduce their budget by 5%. The only exceptions we made in there 
in that request was education. For our school system, we are proposing a $21 million increase so they can continue to provide the type of quality education that our children need. But more importantly, we lose too many of our good teachers and our good principals for seven and five thousand dollars to other jurisdictions. If you look at the surrounding jurisdictions, if you can pick out a great school, and I'm sure in another another hat, uh, Susan Hubbard can tell you how many teachers, how many principals that have gone on to other schools that are number one and number two in the nation, high schools and elementary schools, that got their start right here in Prince George's County. So we're keeping the budget, we're, we're adding $21 million to our education system. By the end of May, we're gonna announce our major education initiative, where we're not just putting money, but we're also putting manpower and resources and looking at innovative programs that will help move us along. The other place we did not ask to do a cut was public safety. We asked them to do more with less. But we are also making sure that we have the manpower they need to staff throughout Prince George's County. It's a big county. So the police department class will have 150 new officers. The fire department will have 50 uh, new fire and EMS folks in the budget. Our corrections will go up, our corrections department. Uh, our sheriff's department, we've added six new deputy sheriffs, I believe, Barry. Yes. And in our state's attorney's office, you know, the sheriff and the state's attorney are terrific people. They are working very hard. Twice a month they meet with me and, and Barry Stanton, who's our deputy CAO for public safety, and, up, and on the fifth floor, and we go over the crime stats for Prince George's County and how we as a public safety organization can combat it. The sheriff is a terrific partner, doing a lot with less. He needs probably about 20 more deputy sheriffs. We can only give him six, because we don't have the funds for it. Our state's attorneys, we're gonna add 16 new state's attorneys. That still means she's woefully understaffed. She's carrying a caseload like Baltimore City where they have 200 state uh, assistant state's attorneys. She's doing a great job with just a few. But we held the line on public safety. Every place else, we asked them to cut and to provide services. The other place that we're gonna, we're going to, uh, we gave to the council in our budget was we talked about this fund called the Economic Development Incentive Fund, where for Prince George's County, we did something no other jurisdiction is doing to make ourselves more competitive. We took $50 million and we put it in a fund to invest in neighborhoods just like this, to attract businesses, to help businesses grow, and to spur economic development in these areas around our metro system. Places like Suitland, Naylor Road, Branch Avenue, Largo Morgan Boulevard, all along these areas, and you'll see this when we do our neighborhood initiative, we're gonna invest that money. Much like the president tried to do with stimulus money, we're putting that money into the community to try and grow businesses along here so people wanna stay in these areas and grow their businesses. Once again, for a very selfish reason. The more businesses that we have here in this county, the more jobs it creates, the more people have jobs, the more taxes they pay, the more we can invest in education, the more we can invest in public safety. It is also for another good reason that we're asking the council to once again put 11 million of that $50 million up for spending in, in fiscal year 13. And that is because in Prince George's County, unlike most of our surrounding neighbors, the majority of our money to fund this county comes from property taxes. The majority of our money that funds this government comes from property taxes. We are completely taxed out. I don't know about you, but I can't afford to pay any more in property taxes. So that means when, the, when, when, when Annapolis starts sending us a bill talking about they're gonna, they're gonna increase the amount that we're gonna pay at the local level, We've got to turn to what? We asked the council this, this year, we put a 50 cent uh, raised in the transfer tax, 50 cents per 
$500 worth of transaction for uh, transfer, uh, transfer tax for properties that are sold. That's going to raise us about $5 million. Clearly, no way to run a government. We have got to grow our commercial businesses. We've got to balance it. We're somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of our money comes from property taxes, where if you look at our neighbors in Montgomery County and you want to know why they can put more uh, resources into education, it's because they're balanced. The majority of their money is coming from commercial taxes. So that means when the economy tanks in real estate, like it's doing now, and the rebound's going to take longer, they're not depending on residential property. They're depending on businesses and amusement tax. So that's what we're going to do in this county, and that's what that $50 million uh, is about. The other thing, real quick, is, um, you know, and I know this is controversial. Uh, in fact, I just spent what seems like an eternity in Annapolis talking about it. And that's the whole uh, gaming bill that's in Annapolis. Whether we bring a high-end casino uh, resort destination to Prince George's County. Now, a lot of people, and I am very upfront with folks, when I was in Annapolis, I voted against slots um, for the eight years I was there. To me, it didn't make economic sense for Prince George's County. But a couple of things that happened in between the time I was there and back in private life. <laughs> oh, y'all laughing, and one of, them, one of them happened to be the county executive, and we're broke. But it's not the major one. Um, just think about it. One, we didn't have a referendum where people actually spoke out on whether, in fact, they want gaming in the state. We've had that. People have had their say. You know, it's here. The other thing is we didn't have a site like National Harbor where you could actually build a destination resort which would attract businesses to it and not take away from it. The final thing is, yes, we do need resources. $69 million, our estimate, estimation would, $69 million would come to Prince George's County each year from having this facility there. And the final thing is, you know, there's a, there's a facility that's going to go up in Anne Arundel County. And the biggest person against having Prince George's County having a site is Anne Arundel County. Is it because he's against gaming? No. It's because we're the attraction. So just think about it. The majority of the funds that are going to go to this facility in Anne Arundel County are going to come from Prince George's County. And you know what we get out of that? Zero. We get what every other jurisdiction gets, and that is education trust fund money. Just that. But for additional revenues going to the local government, go to Anne Arundel County. They don't come to Prince George's County, but you're going to pay for it. And so, no, I'm not ashamed to go down there and say, if you're going to take resident revenues from our citizens, they should come back to help this community. If we're going to deal with the problems of gambling, the revenue should come back here so we can deal with it. That's why we, when we talked about this, we put $11 million for housing uh, stabilization funds in the gaming bill so that we can go after foreclosures issues. We put $11 million for economic development so we can try and help some of the businesses right here stay in this area. We put $6 million, and one of the questions is going to be about our nonprofit and faith communities coming in after these grants, which are limited. We put $6 million in there so we can fund some of these nonprofits and faith communities that are standing in the gap where the government closes down. We took $20 million and we split it between education and, um, and public safety. So, no, I do not. I'm not ashamed to say if you're going to take money from residents of Prince George's County, it should come back here to benefit us. Or you should scrap it for everybody. I just want to be treated like everyone else. I want to make sure we get our fair share. So that's one of the things. Um, but I want to make sure, and I know that uh, I want to introduce our, our group up here because they're, they're very excited about answering your questions. They hope you have a lot of questions because you know, they came prepared. They studied hard. You know, they got all these notes. 
you know, I know Levon is waiting for the for the questions about uh, about the uh, nonprofits and, and outreach. Um, before I do that, if you allow me once again, I know our senator, who's a hard fighter uh, in Annapolis, did a yeoman's job down there, took on the tough issues. Uh, is here is Joanne C. Benson. Can we give her a round of applause? And. And if I can, I promise I'll be brief, but can I have you come up here and just address us real quick, just in case? Um, you're not, you're not going to lecture me, are you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good it really is a pleasure for me to be here. And I'll tell you the reason why. When... Rashawn Baker decided to run for the county executive seat. One of the things that I was concerned about before I decided to support him was to talk to him about the Suitland community. And he will tell you that we had a real, real in-depth conversation about the fact that I, I felt so strongly that this is one of the communities that has been sorely neglected. Sorely. The absence of sidewalks, the appearance of Suitland Road, the mound of dirt, right. and the list goes on and on. And so while I was in Annapolis, Mr. County Executive, I sent my representatives here, Abdul. Rahim Abdullah, who came to ask you all to give us a needs analysis. And you all, I, thank, I want to thank this wonderful president and her staff. Because they compiled a list and we presented it to the county executive. But we didn't have to do much because he understood he came here before he was elected to office so that he could see what needed to be done. And he made a commitment to me regarding the Suitland community and inside the Beltway. And he has not fallen short of what he promised. I love people who say what they mean and mean what they say. And then he has the good sense to surround himself with the best and the brightest. And I want him to know that I deeply appreciate the fact that he has not fallen short on what he said. And, and I want us just to talk really quickly for two minutes about my position relative to gambling. When the idea was first presented to the Senate and they called us in to talk about it, we looked at what they were planning to put in the bill and I was in opposition. I need to let you know that. And the reason why I was in opposition was this. I said there is no minority ownership. There's a difference between participation and ownership. Mm -hmm. We wanted minorities, and when I say minorities, I'm talking about African Americans since we make up the vast majority of the people in Prince George's County. There was an absence. The second was I felt that there was not enough money in the bill that dealt with the social ills that would come with gambling. And so they decided that they were going to first recraft the bill and do what this county executive just said. But when phone calls started coming into my office, there were people who were in opposition and there were people who were for the casinos. The vast majority of the people who called our office were people who wanted an opportunity to say yes or no. And so in the bill, we put, it must come back to Prince George's County so that the voters can make the decision. And when it left the Senate and went over to the House, that was what was on the bill, that we were going to have you all to make the decision. And that was not get, tr getting us off the hook. But we, because of the number of people who were saying we are for, those who were saying we are against, was almost 50% on both sides. So we said, let's, let's take it back to Prince George's County. 
Now, what has happened, ladies and gentlemen, was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. I've never, I've been down in Annapolis 22 years, I never saw anything like it. I'm telling you, one minute before 12, everything stopped. And that was incredible. But I could go on and on talking tonight, but I'm just glad to be here. But I'm glad to, uh, Mr. County Executive. Yes, ma'am. You're looking at some wild people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, don't get these people started. I'm telling you, these are some wild people in here. And they are wonderful, and it's a joy for me to work with you all. And I want you to know that if we can help you in any way, don't hesitate to call my office. Uh, the, a lot of you participate in the 202 Coalition, which is wonderful. But if you need my help for anything, I don't have any cows to milk or any chickens to feed. I'm there in the house by myself with the Lord. So you can call on me anytime. May the Lord continue to bless you and lift you up. And we're going to staunchly support this county executive because he is doing a magnificent job. Thank you. She, she, indeed, she is indeed the best. Let me, uh, <laughs> and I do listen when she calls. And she calls often. Um, <laughs> with the list. Um, why don't I have everyone introduce themselves and then we're going to go through the list of questions and then hopefully get some uh, question and answer uh, back and forth. And what you do, so we'll know how to what direct the arrow to you. Um, Christian Rhodes, I'm the Education Policy Advisor for Mr. Ex uh, county Executive Sharon Baker. My job primarily is to act as a liaison from the County Exec's Office to the County Council to the Board of Education, Dr. Hike. Um, Senator Benson and her colleagues in Annapolis and work with stakeholders just like you all as a community and my colleagues here in the county um, agency as well. Good evening. My name is Susan Hubbard and I am representing our director from the Department of Public Works and Transportation, Dr. Haitham Hajazi. So I will be here for your road and sidewalk and streetlight questions. Oh. <laughs> all right, Senator, that's enough. Good evening. My name is Eric Brown. I'm the director of the Department of Housing and Community Development. And one of the programs we have is a community development block grant program, which we'll be talking about later. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ben Burge. I'm the deputy director for the Office of Management and Budget, so I can take any of your general budget questions. Sure. Good evening, everyone, and Ms. Benson. Ms. Benson has been in my office and beat me up a number of times, but we made progress. My name's Barry Stanton. I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Public Safety. I oversee the police, the fire, corrections, homeland security, coordinate with the sheriff and the courts and the citizens' oversight panel. So uh, I'm here to help. Thank you very much. And no, the cane is not because Senator Benson was in my office beating me up. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Aubrey Thaggart. I'm Assistant Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Economic Development and Public Infrastructure. I'm the uh, Senior Administrative Officer responsible for housing, revitalization, and transportation within uh, county government. So that means Department of Public Works and Department of Housing Community Development and their related agencies report to me. Good afternoon. I'm Captain Grant. I'm the acting commander of the District 3 Police Station. That's the station that's responsible for the Siouxland community, along with other areas of uh, this location. Um, I will uh, add a, a few technical details, because that's what budget people do on the grants process. Um, there are basically three pots of money. The county executive has money that goes to nonprofits. The county council has a pot of money that goes to nonprofits. And each individual council member has a smaller pot that they allocate themselves. The, the process for applying for these grants um, for the next fiscal year, because fiscal 12 is over, and the, the, um, uh, so there's no, there are no applications for this current year. But in the upcoming fiscal year, which starts July 1st, um, usually the process is put into place sometime in the July to September time frame. Um, so you can contact um, the county executive's office or your county uh, council member's office. You can go to the website, either the county executive's website or the, um, the council's website, and get all the information on how to apply. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is the, the Baker administration has introduced 
some uh, criteria for what type of organizations can apply, and these criteria are applied to all organizations, so it's done very fairly and very transparently. Um, so once, um, once these grant amounts are determined and the process is finalized, there will be lots of press announcements. Um, it'll be very out in the open, and you can, um, we would encourage you to look into applying at that time. Very good. Thank you. As you can see, we brought the entire government out here to you tonight. Um, one of the things I'm going to try and make sure is we're going to keep our answers as short as possible because that way afterwards you'll at least have the chance to answer, uh, to talk to some of the individuals uh, and get uh, greater detail. Um, the budget process, question one was please explain the budget process and how funding is allocated for the Suitland community. Um, the budget process is one we go through. Uh, the first thing we try to do is close the deficit, which I said this year was $126 million. If you remember last year, we closed a deficit of $77 million. Um, we have to do this at the same time when revenues in the county uh, is declining. Our property values have declined over 50% over the last five years, 50%. Um, so we're trying to provide services with less money. So the first thing is to make sure that we hold the line on those things that are most important to the county, education, public safety. Then the other is to make sure our agencies, especially transportation, housing, and other critical social services, family services, all of those were at least held steady so they can provide um, the services. The second part of the question is, says, how is money allocated to the Suitland community? The benefit of the Suitland community and communities, what we call or sometimes refer to inside the Beltway, um, once again, I try to be very honest with people because I don't want nobody else to, you know, people come with me later on and say the county executive lied to me. He said he was going to spread money throughout the entire county. I know that ain't possible, so how is he doing that? I'm not. The focus of this administration, um, as long as I'm county executive, until we get to where we need to be, We'll be focusing on those communities inside the Beltway, near metro centers that have the potential, potential to help us attract businesses and grow. For Suitland and the surrounding communities like Hillcrest Heights, Naylor Road, places like that, Oxon Hill, for those communities, this administration is going to take the limited resources we have get the resources we, we have from the state and the federal government and combine our efforts to make sure money goes into this community. So it's a long way of saying we're going to pay a lot of attention to Suitland in funding, not just for a little bit, not for a year, not for two years, but for a duration. You know, years ago when I was in the House of Delegates, we put $6 million into Suitland, but then we stopped. We put money in there, but we didn't continue. You look what happens if we had continued funding this area the same way we did Route 1. And I love Route 1. I love Hyattsville and that area. But we continue to fund it, and you look at the Arts District and what has happened. There is no reason we can't do the same here. So Suitland will see a lot of the funding over these next years. Now, I will get complaints, and I'm sure when they see this, um, from areas outside this outside the inner beltway area and you know what you know and and i i'm very honest with them we have got to use our resources to try and maximize it and leverage those funds so we can attract businesses i believe this is the best way as we meet uh, the district with its growth question three and i think levon will answer this has please provide us with a list of nonprofit organizations to support supporting uh, the suitland community uh, I think Levon, and you can do that. Uh, so what we'll make sure is that uh, um, Levon on Saturday there's going to be this big conference. Part of what we want to do on the big nonprofit conference is to see what people are doing. We got a limited amount of funds we can spend for nonprofit and faith community that are doing good things in the neighborhood. It, we need to find if there are synergies between these nonprofits out here, so we maximize how we use our funds. So part of this is not only to build capacity, but to build synergy. As someone who came from the nonprofit community, I know how hard it is to get money, but I know how equally hard it is to leverage those dollars. So we're going to be looking to do capacity. Uh, so Levon is the person um, who will handle that. 
The next one Christian is excited about, um, and maybe he knows the answer, or at least uh, uh, can tell us what's going to happen. This is dealing with uh, William Bean Elementary School, and maybe you can talk about some of our education initiatives. What, William, Bean, what, William, William Bean Elementary School. Um, can, we, can we have Christian to uh, sure. repeat his name, please? Christian yeah. Rhodes, uh, Rhodes, Christian like church, Rhodes like scholar, but far from That's it. That's a good point. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I did a little bit of research, thanks um, to Ms. Karen, uh, for sending in the question ahead of time. I talked with the school system, met with Park and Planning, and here's the most up-to-date information we have about the project over at William Bean um, as of March 22nd. Um, there's a number of things going on, but number one, there's a base plan. I think that's the one. I, I brought maps, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave the maps with you as well. So there's, there's four options on the table right now. There's a base plan that I think most of you are waiting for. That's the one that money was allocated for. Um, and it was supposed to already start moving forward. That was um, right now, according to Park and Planning, the school system estimated date of completion, um, June 2014. They already designed it, and they're already ready to go. There's uh, a little bit of a wrinkle there because there's some questions about one or two, one major thing, which is disruption of the school while construction is going on. So while you're doing construction, there's also students in a school building. There was questions whether or not that should actually occur. Would they be able to get it done before school started or not? So they actually went back, and I believe Council Member Tolles is, and has also been working well on the, the William Bean Project and working with Park and Plan to figure out what's going on as well. There's other, three other options that were available, and here's the reason why there's three other options available. One is because they talk, talked about a shared community garden, a shared community garden for the school and for the community. That would actually have to separate the, you wouldn't have to worry about interrupting the building. Now you build a completely separate entity. The other um, is expansion of the gymnasium to actually be more than just the gymnasium that we, we currently see, but a college-sized college gymna gymnasium that could be used for community as well. And the fourth option, and I brought, it, I brought a, picture, a picture and the kind of overall look at that as well, not just, so actually expanding a complete separate process completely, a complete separate building that's a gymnasium by itself, a community center by itself, and a shared garden as well. Now all these options are here on the table. I'll, I'll leave them with Ms. Anderson. Um, my understanding is that they're meeting again next week to finalize this process because, as I said, Council Member Tolles, several board members, and several others have been pushing them to make a final decision and move forward, primarily because those funds are already allocated. And you know, like I know, when funds are allocated, you need to spend those funds before something else occurs. So right. I will get back um, and, and give a more complete answer. But I know, Council Member Tolles, you have. pressure from the county council and county executive on the school system to move forward with this. Once we turn the money over to them, of course, you know, it's, it's using the bully pulpit. And so we're going to stay on top of that. Uh, Senator? Uh, Mr. County Executive, one of the items uh, that, uh, that we are, I'm, I'm going to be talking with uh, Council Member Toes. We have talked uh, about it. We need a new Suitland High School. Yes. Yes. It is on the list. It's on the list. We need to do it without fail. Yes, we do. I can't wait to get to that question. I'm going to answer that one myself. Can everybody say something? Well, no, we have to open it now. Yeah. yeah. We're going to try and get through this quick. Um, the next one has to do with Suitland Technology Center. Aubrey, I don't know if you have an update on this that you can give us real quick. And Eric. Okay. Our director, Eric Brown, identify yourself when you answer the question. Sure. Good evening again. My name is Eric Brown. I'm Director of Housing Community Development. Uh, with respect to the Technology Center, they have money, as you, as you, as you pointed out. The, the project has had a few fits and, and starts, but I'm proud to say that it is moving forward, and Pat back there shaking her head. <laughs> uh, Pat, uh, Pat Isaac on my staff is a project manager at that, that's overlooking this, but they've requested Pat, and they requested it. Raise your hand. Raise your hand, Pat, so they can see you. Uh, the, uh, 
the, the Technology Center has requested an extension because at one point they ran into a problem in terms of permitting. I think that has now been resolved. They've requested a, an extension to the end of the year to get the project completed, and we have granted them that extension. So we expect them to, to be moving forward with it. Why don't we go to public safety? Uh, Barry, why don't you take this question for us? Barry, identify yourself. Barry Stanton, I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Public Safety. I think uh, probably uh, in uh, this week on Wednesday, we'll be making some announcements about our uh, neighborhood uh, transformation initiative. I don't want to take the thunder away from the county executive, but I can assure you. Suitland will be a part of a focus area to deal with crime. I can I assure you of that. The other thing is we worked very hard last year to bring crime down in Suitland. We're going to continue to, to do that this year. Uh, uh, we've already started making some progress now. I think what you're going to see is that you're going to see a lot of police presence in Suitland. I still believe until we start tackling the overall crime rate in Prince George's County, which includes Suitland, you can't improve uh, economic development. I still believe economic development and public safety go hand in hand. So part of our belief, as the county executive has said, is we want to work hard to change that perception. And part of that perception is getting more resources into Suitland. But let me just say, it's not just Suitland. We're going to focus on six focus areas within the Beltway. And we're going to fight crime from the south end of the county all the way to the north end of the county. And part of that fight in crime is going to include Suitland. So that's our commitment. Uh, Captain, I don't know, uh, this is your area if you have any more to say, but I can tell you we reduced crime in Suitland almost 12 to 15 percent last year during the summer crime initiative. Right. We reduced homicides. But let me just tell you, we're going to reduce homicides a lot more in Prince George's County this year coming up. Right. Because the perception is if we can stop killing people, if we can stop, start making a difference in our young people, then we have changed the perception of Prince George's County, which brings improvement in economic development. So that's where we're going. So you're going to see some changes here. And Senator Benson and all of you have my number. So call me anytime. <laughs> call him. Please call him. He's lonely up there. Let, 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 me, let me say this uh, before we go on, on about uh, Councilwoman Tolls is here. She helped pass a dance hall bill that singly helped reduce crime in this area. And when Barry talks about dropping, just think about it. We were at a 35-year low in, um, in crime in Prince George's County last year. A lot of that had to do with the efforts uh, that she did by taking an issue and running with it and forcing every agency to come on board. So let's give her a round of applause for that. That was big. That was a major accomplishment. Um, the next question I will answer, and it talks about rebuilding Suitland High School. My favorite place, there you go. You know, I, I agree, uh, President Anderson. Um, having spent the last, uh, wow, um, almost 14 years in that high school over there, having three children go through it and not seeing the changes that we want to see there especially for those, my children were in the visual and performing arts. And if you've ever gone to a play, how many of you have gone to a play over there? You sit in the seats where half of them are missing, or you go to the annex where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's shameful. And we've got kids who are going on to do great things. One thing I will guarantee you, that we are going to redo Suitland High School. That right, if nothing else happens in this administration, Suitland High School will be redone. We're going to get a first class performing arts center that is a community base. There is no reason we can't have a community performing arts center that's for the Suitland community. We already have kids who are ready to perform. So why can't that anchor the revitalization of this arts district? You know? It is starts with having a re, redoing that center there. The other is fixing up the school. So we're going to get money, um, and, and thank you, Senator Benson and, and your colleagues, 
for starting the process of getting money to help us. I told the governor, we don't need money to build new things. We need money to do major renovation. I don't care what you call it. Just give us the money so that we can, we can redo Suitland. We're going to redo Oxon Hill, which is, in the, which is in the budget right now, Oxon, Oxon Hill High School. But there's no reason for our children not to go to a world first class um, high school, and that will happen. That I can guarantee you. The, um, and I think that answers uh, eight with the Performing Arts Theater. So everybody will be invited to, and, and I'm glad you put down here for seniors and for students to come and uh, see performances there. Uh, the next one is Banquet Hall, Use Community Meeting Events. Okay. Okay. All right. So, beautification of Suitland. Where is the action plan for rebuilding Suitland Manor? Eric, are you on? <laughs> uh, good evening again. My name is Eric Brown. I am, this time, I'm the director of the Redevelopment Authority. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, Don't you to save money. <laughs> Suitland is, let me, just, let me just say, I know that any time you mention the redevelopment of Suitland Manor, everybody look at you like, oh, yeah, right. Uh, but I can assure you that of this. The county executive has made the redevelopment of Suitland Manor a high priority. Okay, right. he's made that abundantly clear. Where we are now is that we are looking at what our options are, and then we have, before the end of this year, it is our goal and our and it is our goal and our ambition that by the end of this year you have a definitive plan with a timeline for the redevelopment of Suitland Manor. You won't have anything coming out the ground, but at least you'll know what it's gonna look like and a timeline for getting it done. And more importantly, where funding is coming from. Because that's Absolutely. the important thing. Whether where funding is coming from. Because a lot of times you've heard we've heard plans over the last, you know, ten years. But if there's no dollars attached, then nothing's going to happen. So knowing not only the plan, but where the dollars where the are coming. coming from. Yep. Uh, for the next one, Aubrey, you're on. Okay. You want to tell them who you are and the question. Okay. See. You, Good know which, you know which question you have? Uh, I believe it yeah. would be the one after the Sula Manor question number 12 here. Once again, my name is Aubrey Thaggart. I'm Assistant Deputy Chief. Administrative Officer for Economic Development and Public Infrastructure. And uh, the next question is about funding for more inspectors to ensure that residential and commercial property owners are held accountable and maintain their properties according to county codes. Last year, uh, for the FY12 mm -hmm. fiscal year, we approved, uh, the council approved six more uh, inspectors for the Department of Environmental Resources. Uh, this year, there are no more uh, plans for additional inspectors, however, what we have had DER do is to focus especially on areas such as Sudland in terms of uh, problem commercial storefronts, uh, especially with our liquor stores. We are increasing enforcement on liquor stores in terms of their signage and also uh, helping to deal with the issues of loitering around those areas and other public hazards. And with regards to property standards in the residential areas, Mr. Stan just mentioned to you about uh, a neighborhood initiative that we're going to be embarking on within the next couple of days. Part of that neighborhood initiative is going to be focusing and intensifying our efforts on vacant and abandoned properties as well as those properties that are foreclosed on and ensuring that those real estate owned assets are being properly maintained by the banks here. So what we have done is we're not just pulling, like for instance here, Captain Grant with the police department. We're putting together agencies such as DER, such as Department of Public Works and Transportation to go and inspect those conditions. Suitland is one of those areas that's been targeted for this type of intensive enforcement here. And what we're going to be doing is outreaching to you here in the community about what we're doing here and also to get more information and feedback about certain problem areas that we may have missed as a result of that. Thank you. Uh, if we can pass the mic to uh, Susan Hubbard. You're up. <laughs> We, we need, oh, all right, no injuries, we don't have any No, no, just, just the purse, just the purse. 
Uh, good evening. Question 13. My, my name is Susan Hubbard, and I am from the Department of Public Works and Transportation. And having worked with your political leaders, you all don't know how fortunate you are to have your council member and your senator, with whom I worked at the school system previously, and your county executive, who this is truly his second home. You are very fortunate to have these advocates. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that we're going to repave every street, but I can't. We do, um, we are going to be instituting a new program, which is our pavement management system, and it is taking the political out of roadway repaving. It prioritizes the roads. So they will be classified in three different categories, poor, fair, and good. And those, road, and those roadways that are classified as poor will be the first roadways that we will be doing. Um, there was a question about Silver Hill Road. Silver Hill Road is not a county maintained roadway. I don't know if you all are familiar with the difference. A state roadway has a name and a number. A county roadway just has a name. But I took your request and we forwarded it to the state and the state is going to be looking at that particular roadway. Um, this year we're going to be repaving, resurfacing, Suitland Road, the, the rest of Suitland Road. Oh, don't get, yes. don't get. S <laughs> almost, not quite. Suitland Road from Silver Hill to Eastern Lane, and then when that is finished, we will be doing from Eastern Lane to Bell Green Street. That's this year. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of money to go around, so we're trying to be as prudent as we can. And in FY13, we will be resurfacing from Bell Green to Regency. And then we're trying to work with the state to get the state to do their portion of Suitland Road as well. And one person with whom you can work very closely is your senator to get the state folks to move in that direction. Our director has identified a new program that will save the county money, but will be able to do more resurfacing within your communities. We'll fill the potholes, and we're going to put what we call slurry seal over the roadways, and it will make them a much smoother transition. Those roadways in this budget year are Regency Parkway, Brooks Drive, and Marlboro Pike from Brooks Drive to the district line. The cut and patch, which is just basically concrete work, under drain, sidewalk, curb and gutter. And I don't normally read, but it was so exciting to actually get a list of roadways. I didn't want to forget any of them. Marlboro Pike, Rollins Avenue, Lorton Avenue, Opus Avenue, Pacific Avenue, and Topica, T-O-P-I-C-A Avenue. Those are the roadways that will have the concrete work done on them. And the street light projects that are currently in the queue, and we work very closely with the police department in this particular area. Auth Road at Authway, Old Soper Road at Branch Avenue near the Metro, the 5800 block of Suitland Road, Iverson Street, and Wingate Road. So those are the ones that are in the hopper for this year and will be done during the construction year. Then next year we have a list of roadways that we have included for the cut and patch and for the slurry seal. We have a small department. We have 450 staff members. Our neighboring jurisdiction has over 1,800. The reason I say that is to let you know that we are a very large county and we need your help in letting us know where there are potholes, where there are sidewalk, trip hazards, where you need street lights. We can't be everywhere at any given time in the county. And several of you all are community partners and I'd like to invite all of you to become our community partner and just report to us. You don't have to do anything. Just report to us where those problems exist. And you can do that very easily by calling 301 499-8520. 499-8520. And those of you who are our partners here, if you could share the information with the other folks here, we would greatly appreciate it. Terrific.
let, let, let me say this, uh, and, and Susan's absolutely right, and Eric, I'm going to let you get the last question. A couple of things I want to mention about, uh, we talked about uh, lighting, sidewalks, um, roads. One of the reasons I was down in Annapolis badgering uh, the senator and her colleagues and trying to help the governor pass his transportation bill was because the county needs more funds. As Susan said, you know, we're limited. We're right now, and she could tell you this if you had time, we're taking care of a lot of state roads. Yes. You know why? Because when you call our office or you call Councilmember Toll's office or Senator uh, Benson's office, it's not your job to figure out whether it's a county road or a state road. It just needs to be fixed. If you see a light out, you don't care whose light it is, you want it fixed. If there are no sidewalks for our children to walk on as they go to schools, you don't care whether it's the county's issue or the state issue. Your taxes go to both of us. So what we've said to Susan and her department and, 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 and Haitham Hajai is we want you to fix these things. Yes, we know we're cutting your budget. We want you to find a way to fix it. Um, but what my job as county executive is, as I said, to go down to Annapolis, to badger the governor, to badger delegates, to badger senators, so we get more money in Prince George's County, and we get more money that flows back here to these communities because we can't do economic development without infrastructure dollars. So if you hear me talk about these things, like you know the gaming bill, the reason I was for it, it's $11 million in uh, economic development dollars I don't have. It's $11 million a year I could put toward it. Um, so we're going to fight to make sure we do that. The other thing is the last question is question 15. And Eric Brown, you're up again. OK. Uh, <laughs> again, my name is Eric Brown, uh, Department of Housing. Uh, the last question had to do with home improvement, funding for home improvement for seniors who are unable to fix up their property. The premier program that we have in the Department of Housing is what we call the Single Family uh, Rehab Program. And under this program, a, a, a senior could get their home fixed up and brought up to code. The, the stipulation is that it has to be in fairly good condition. You have, to be, you have to own the property. You can't owe more on the property than it's worth, okay? And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and 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 the and the maximum the maximum amount of money that we have available is is thirty thousand dollars. That's a, not a lot of money, but at least it can it can help and make a difference to a lot to a lot of people. Uh, to get more information, you the person who runs the program, her name is Pam Wilson, but you can call my office at 301-883-5531. Three, one, and we'll put you in touch with Pam. We'd be glad to hear from you. Can we get that? Thank you. Thank you. Before we open up to questions, um, <laughs> I, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of highlights of the budget that we sent to the council that I just want you to be aware of. And actually, uh, uh, Susan Hubbard reminded me of one of those. They have promised me by the fall, um, we've now set up what we call county stat which is a, a data-driven analysis of your government so that we can see if you call in to fix a pothole, how long it takes us to do that. Or you call in for a light, how long does it take us to do it so we can figure out how to do it better. Um, but you will be able in the near future to go online. You can track us online now, I believe. Um, but you will be able to go online and actually send us an email of those, of, of those things that need to be fixed and then track how our response is. That's to make your government more efficient. As I said, we have to do more with less. So it means we have to use technology in a better way. The other thing is we'll have a 311 system. The District of Columbia has just kicked off as 311. Um, it operates much like 911, but for non-emergency calls. What we found during, I think it was the, the hurricane, or was it the snowstorm, or was it the earthquake? All of them. It was all of them. <laughs> So we had to set up a separate line, so a separate telephone line, so people called in with questions could not, so they wouldn't clog up the 911 system. What we found was 911 was actually operating more efficient because many of the calls 
that were taking their, the operator's time was directed toward this system. 311 will allow us to do that. So when you have questions or, or complaints or things that need to be fixed, a car is parked there too long, a house looks like it's abandoned, a senior citizen needs to be checked on, um, you will be able to call and we'll respond. So we're excited about that. And uh, county stat will be driven by the, uh, the website. The other thing is we put in a budget that we sent to the, the county a energy manager. Now, some of you may say, what is an energy manager? Because that's what I said. It's someone that's going to come help the county be more efficient and make sure we look at ways of saving dollars as it relates to energy and greening. Uh, there's a lot of dollars at the federal level, level for the county becoming more green. And so we want to make sure that we take advantage of that. Um, with that, how much time do I have? Go on. Okay. Okay. You need to add something? to be here and to answer yeah. questions in the community <laughs> for as long as you would like. But um, let, let me just say this before I turn it over. You know, we do these, uh, we take the government out into uh, the community. And as, especially Susan, who, who's done this for a long time uh, with several, with at least two administrations, it is not often that we get a crowd of folks out here and believe me when you just like you we, we worked you know nine to five and we want to come out here and share your government make it better make it efficient that's why we're working for you to have um, two or three people show up is sometimes disheartening yeah. so when you walk into a crowd of people that are engaged and has the questions with us and people show up it makes us feel good about our job. So um, I want you to give yourselves a round of applause. And it makes me proud to be your county executive.